Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Matt Loiza, and I'm the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Tonight's watch event is co-sponsored by both the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and the College of Allied Health and Nursing. Later this month, we are hosting the 2021 Health and Biomedical Summit, which we've entitled Creating Health Equity, Social Justice, and the Social Determinants of Health. The summit is going to examine with a social justice lens, how social determinants such as access to healthcare, education, economic security, safe neighborhoods, and access to community spaces affect public health. We've invited a number of faculty experts and professionals in the community and region, and we hope you'll, you'll join us and mark your dates in the calendar for March 24th. Our keynote speaker for the upcoming summit is Dr. Youssef Salam, who is one of the wrongly accused men that are the subject of the documentary that we'll be watching tonight. Dr. Salam was one of the central figures in a very disturbing example of systemic racial oppression dating back to the late 1980s, when five African-American youths were falsely accused, tried, and convicted in the Central Park Jogger case, which is the focus of the documentary we're about to watch. The exonerated five, as they became known later, spent between seven to 13 years behind bars for crimes that they did not commit until their sentences were overturned in 2002. As we'll see, the decision to overturn the sentences was not followed by any significant public expressions of remorse by local officials, nor was there any extensive effort to examine why the system had failed these young teenagers. The documentary itself, The Central Park Five, is a 2012 production directed by Ken Burns, you've probably heard of, David McMahon, and Sarah Burns. It intertwines the stories of these five young men, their families, the victim, police officers and prosecutors, unraveling the forces behind the wrongful convictions. The film illuminates how law enforcement, social institutions and media undermine the rights of the, of the individuals they were designed to safeguard and protect. And we hope it'll provoke some thought and reflection among us. As you watch over the next couple of hours, hope you'll consider what this story tells us about the following. And there's other things too, but just a couple of things um, that um, we think would be um, you know, worth considering as you watch. Um, one is to consider the role and the availability of public recreational spaces to New Yorkers? And did the case really say anything about how access to these spaces was guarded and maintained for some, but not for others? Another factor to consider is how did newspaper and print, um, newspaper, print and TV depictions of crime change due to factors such as race, class, and gender? And then finally, just how the criminal justice system overall, as the case progressed from its beginnings, treat these five young men. Now, just a couple of te tech tips before you begin. If you have not already done so, please pull up the documentary in your web browser, um, your mobile phone, or any other preferred viewing platform that you're using now. Um, you'll find the link in the, uh, the chat if you need it. Yep, okay, and now it's, it's popping up thanks to our host, so thank you. And just a reminder, if you're accessing the documentary outside of the Minnesota State University Mankato campus Wi-Fi, you'll need to log in with your star ID and password. If you're joining us tonight without Minnesota State star ID, you can purchase or rent the documentary through various streaming platforms for a fee or through your PBS um, subscription. We're not gonna be showing the film in the Zoom um, format just because the resolution is just um, really not all that great. And then finally, um, just as hopefully a helpful FYI, if you're logging in for the first time to the Canopy site, um, which is in the MSU site, if you're logging for the first time into Canopy, what you need to do is click on the don't have an account, get started, that's on the top under login. When you click this, it will open up a box with the university logo and then it will ask you for your star ID and password, and then you should be good. So this Zoom session will remain open throughout the event and we'll get things going again at approximately 8.10. 
p.m. with the moderated panel discussion. Um, so at this time, um, please go ahead and watch the documentary on your own. And um, we'll see you again a little bit after 8 o'clock for discussion. Again, we're looking at 8.10. And uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Okay, so thank you. Um, at this time, though, I'd like to welcome our three panelists who are all faculty in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences here at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Um, so and I'm not sure if the titles are going to appear as they are to me, but it looks like um, to my immediate right, start with Dr. Keva Darbo, who is our chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies with expertise in sociology, economics, and multicultural studies. Right next to him, at least according to me, is Professor Cherise Truesdale-Moore, who is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Corrections with expertise in corrections, criminology, reentry issues, cultural competency, and criminal justice education. And finally, on my far right, Dr. Jamil Haq, who's a native New Yorker and serves as a professor in the history department specializing in world history and the history of the modern Middle East. So welcome panelists and thank you very, very much for participating tonight. Um, let me start by um, asking a question uh, to Professor Hawk, who as a native son of New York can give us some context about uh, Central Park itself. I mean, Jamil, think, you know, if you assume that some people in New York and New England might be vaguely aware of Minnesota, you know, land of 300 ponds or lots of lakes or something, probably, you know, on the flip side, there may be lots of Minnesotans or at least some Minnesotans who see Central Park and, you know, they just maybe think of it as a big park that you see aerial shots in various movies. But I think um, specifically um, with the documentary that we just watched, there's a lot of context that surrounds Central Park with the issues that we're grappling with here, right? Absolutely, and uh, thank you, Dean Loiza, and thank you, Keva and Sharice, for having me uh, alongside them on this panel. Um, I wanted to start, as Matt said, and as Matt noted, that I'm a, a native Brooklynite. <clears throat> um, as an 11-year-old living in the suburbs around New York City, my memory of this case is vivid, and the fear of the urban landscape that was instilled upon us in nearby Long Island was palpable. I want to second what Dr. Wilder said as well in the video that the innocence of the Central Park Five was more or less ignored <laughs> in the press and in the city itself. Uh, as youths, we were told that the city, a mere 28 minute train ride away, may as well have been a foreign country and a war zone. Obviously, that's why we would cut school to head there. And while the uh, Greenwich Village and St. Mark's Place occupied a lot of our imagination, really the largest was Central Park. Central Park was built in the middle of the 19th century by Frederick Law Olmsted. He was the chief architect. Olmsted's plans were based in the future, meaning that he was most concerned with what the park would look like in 20 or 50 or 100 years rather than the immediate. The immediate uh, saw the removal of Seneca Village, which was an African-American settlement located right in the middle of the park. New York City really had not advanced that far north uh, as a unified city quite yet. Uh, the park today and in 1989, is and was a segregated space running from 59th Street to 110th Street in the middle of the island. And it's 20 blocks north and south to a mile, which gives you an idea of the scale. And the park is a half mile wide. It's, it's quite a vast park. Um, the park is divided by design into discrete areas. The Harlem Mirror, which was identified in one of the graphics as the Harlem Lake, is a shallow pond that occupies the northeast corner of the park. This is generally where people of color congregate within the park. And you can actually see the Schoenberg Plaza uh, that, uh, from here. Uh, the reservoir where most people run is actually not that far, just to the south around 96th Street. Uh, and it should be noted in the film that a group of black youths there would have been very conspicuous. Uh, there it's all business. If you walk the wrong direction around the Jackie Kennedy Onassis uh, Reservoir, people will yell at you. Uh, there's no Minnesota nice in the heart of the average Manhattanite. Uh, the bridal path is also a running path that meanders to the park, which was mentioned here. And uh, so now I'll defer to my fellow panelists and, and or back to uh, Dean Loiza 
who will give us some uh, deeper insight into the film and into this uh, case. Thank you very much, Professor Hawk. It just um, strikes me that um, a lot of what you're saying just kind of leads to, I think, one of the um, big issues that the um, really the whole unfortunate incident brings up is that um, looking at our theme of social determinants of health, healthy communities need many things. And um, one of them is certainly safe and accessible leisure spaces. So, you know, if we think about uh, just leisure spaces as a general human and community need, you know, what, what, what do all of you think about what the prime issues and really problems that as a society we face with, with this particular film? I want to just add something for our, our native Minnesotans and non-New Yorkers. Uh, there are tennis courts in Central Park. If you want to use a tennis court in New York City, you need to have a permit. You need to have a permit to use a public tennis court in New York City. So even access to public space is regulated uh, through the state. And uh, that's certainly worth mentioning when it comes to uh, our public spaces in New York. Even if they exist, they're not necessarily accessible. Other thoughts on that? You moved you unmute yourself, Kevin. Yeah, I'm Kevin Dabo. Uh, the the most of the problems that I see living in an urban area, I lived in Minneapolis to East Los Angeles, and also some weeks in New York City, uh, is that many of these urban communities do not have parks or playgrounds for leisure, especially for, for teenagers of color. Uh, when I was in Los Angeles, uh, Magic Johnson, some of you, most of you know him, a basketball star who has retired. What he did was East Los Angeles is basically in the West area where if you know Samford and Samford uh, uh, sitcom was uh, launched, <coughs> very improvised the sitcom. That area now is being gentrified uh, so what he did was to build a basketball court for teenagers after school and even for adults to go and play and socialize uh, because they did not have any place to go. Uh, this area is very close to University of Southern California. Uh, so in the, in the parlance of uh, uh, sociologists, that's like a ghetto, it's a marginalized community uh, and uh, access to parks and uh, recreational facilities are very much uh, lacking. So that is one way of engaging student, uh, of teenagers because many sociologists, especially health chiefs, uh, which came out of uh, 1967 in Sacramento, uh, to be precise in San Jose area, he looked at four elements that really highlight how teenagers or, uh, or the youth bonding. One is commitment, <clears throat> the is attachment, and the other is belief. And he, in his uh, analysis is that if those variables are weakened in society, you'll find the youth to become more uh, deviant. They commit crimes that are not really uh, 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 legal, and uh, they commit crimes that tend to put them in harm's way, especially with the police and so forth. So his suggestion was to create an environment where this youth can be engaged, uh, be involved with their communities so that they have a sense of belonging. And this sense of belonging also is very true if we look at the Crips and the Bloods uh, in Los Angeles area. The Crips are mostly in in the, in the, in the East Los Angeles area. The Bloods are mostly in the Compton area uh, ever uh, documented when they see us in one of the <clears throat> is, uh, Central Park Five uh, narrated that uh, a piece of that too. She's from uh, Compton. Compton used to be predominantly African-American, but today it's pretty much mixed more Hispanic than African-American. But uh, 
So that growth of the gang gangster movement also has affected that Lisho area issue because they didn't have anything to do with the youth. So they engage in deviant behavior. Uh, so the fight between the Crips and the Bloods, we could see that the younger people are the, are the, are the Bloods and the Crips are the older uh, people living in East Los Angeles. Uh, so this is still a problem in the, in the urban communities. So how do we engage the youth uh, in the urban communities is still an unanswered question. The other thing that I want to add to um, Dr. Dabo's comments is that one, we can also see from the film <clears throat> and some of the information that Dr. Bo provided is that um, urban community is consistent, um, providing very little leisure spaces for youth. That's what we see, that's common. I saw that common in Baltimore. I oftentimes would want to take my niece to a park, but I had to be very thoughtful about what park and where I was taking her because in some communities you found needles in park, drug needles in parks. So you had to be very cautious about that. The other thing that I want to add to those spaces, particularly as it relates to the film, is that those areas are highly policed. So even if children want to go outside and play then they're faced, they, they're faced in harm's way by maybe other people in their community, but also um, treated harshly from the police. They're, those areas are what criminal justice calls hot spots. And so if you see higher rates in those communities, it's because those communities are also um, more policed than other communities. The other thing that I wanted to add to that is the fact that <clears throat> when there, um, as many of those communities don't have um, proper um, uh, grocery stores and things of that nature where they can sustain um, healthy living and food and so forth like that. So considering, considering that there is, when there's poor nutrition, research has said that if there's poor nutrition, um, poor um, physical activity um, with children, it's highly co correlated with um, child delinquency. Now, I do wanna be mindful that in this film, these children weren't doing anything wrong. So I don't wanna perpetuate you know, conversation like we're supporting um, the police, these children were being children, they were healthy minded kids and they weren't doing anything wrong. What we should, should um, 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 state, I do believe, is saying that when, when we don't have proper um, resources in place, healthy children, law abiding children will be placed in harm's way. <clears throat> um. Professor Truesdale, if I could ask a follow-up question on that. Um, when it comes to the, um, just the policing of spaces, you know, it, it struck me as the film went on um, and, and they're just going through the chronology <coughs> that the, the youngest of the Central Park Five, I believe was 14. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, so that's when it really, you know, when you're, when you're getting to the um, police interrogations and so forth, and then later on, it's very clear that um, these youth are not being treated as children, um, but they're being viewed as, you know, as, as hostile predatory adults. So I guess, do you kind of see that in the actual policing structures of these public spaces as just a kind of a, a default start absolutely. point? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, young, um, uh, African-American um, boys are oftentimes seen as older than they really are. They're treated older than they really are. They are devalued um, because of that. Um, and what I want to also say is that um, children can be um, certified as an adult depending on their offense. So in this case, the offense that they committed could or they had um, uh, were accused, I want to say, were accused to have committed, they could be certified 
as an adult and then transferred to adult facility. And uh, once an adult, always an adult. Even if you are 15, 16 the next year and you commit another crime, once an adult, always an adult. So they, you will never be um, dealt with in the juvenile justice system. You will be dealt with in the adult system. And what's interesting about Corey is that Corey was the oldest that was transferred to an adult facility. I think he was 16 or something like that. He, he was transferred to an adult facility. And research has shown that children who are placed in an adult facility are definitely put in harm's way. They are more likely to be abused. They're more likely to be victimized. They're, and they're more likely to commit suicide in adult facilities. He was I also the one who seemed to have a lot of traumatic um, experiences from, you know, he was um, actually even in, in another documentary, he was asked to be placed in or they placed him in solitary confinement just to, for his own protection. And research has shown placing any inmate in solitary confinement is a traumatic experience and it's hard to heal from that. I, Matt, I want to let our viewers know the, the five teenagers involved in <clears throat> and the ages that they are. Uh, one is Kevin Richardson, he was 14. Raymond Santana, who he was 14. Antron McRae, he was 15. Yusuf Salam was 15 and Corey Weiss was 16. Today they are all in their 40s. So at the time they were arrested, they were all teenagers, except Corey was basically considered as an adult and put in isolation. And that also had a very traumatic impact on him as uh, Dr. Truesdale said. The accuser is Teresa, was Teresa Melly. Uh, so I just want to put the characters out there so we know who they are and uh, what uh, uh, stage they were at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. just, uh, so I want to highlight that. The other piece of the uh, debate on this issue is the impact it has because Sharice and I know in, in chronology, we tend to really look at policing as, as a stratified issue because society is stratified along class lines, social class. And the upper class, the middle class and the lower class, the lower class tend to be more policed than the middle and the upper class. If you look at the usage of cocaine and crack, crack being uh, uh, lesser, uh, prestigious uh, 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 caffeine as compared to cocaine itself, which is powder, uh, has a more harsher uh, sentencing guidelines because it's used by mostly teenagers and youth and adults in marginalized communities. Whereas the powder form of it, cocaine is used in Hollywood and other places and those people are not really readily policed as much as those in the urban areas, so the, that, is, that inequality is built in already uh, through the policing of communities because the lower class communities tend to be policed heavily as compared to the middle and the upper classes. Uh, so okay. that brings about inequality in the criminal justice system already. I, I, and I'd, I'd like to add on to what Keba was saying and talk about, you know, for, for years after um, the event September 11th, New York. Uh, Professor, can I just jump in for one moment? I just want to cue sure. the um, audience to one point. Our original plan was to wrap the discussion up um, around 8.30. Um, so we're kind of at our original jumping off point, but a couple of days ago, uh, you know, the panel unanimously agreed that we'd push a little further just because of the complexity of the issues. So um, if you can stick around, please do so. And we're gonna continue hopefully for another 10 to 15 minutes. Um, if you can't stay on, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and please remember that um, we do invite you to um, hear Dr. Youssef Salam himself speak on March 24th, 8.30 a.m. as part of the 2021 Health and Biomed Summit. 
Uh, it's free and open to the public, but you do have to register. Um, so you can visit the link at mnsu.edu. I think it's backslash health summit. The link is in the chat for your convenience. So you don't have to copy down what I'm saying, get it horribly wrong or something. So um, anyway, with that, I apologize. Go ahead. I uh, just wanted to get that plug in there. Well, well, as Matt noted, when you ask professors how long they want to talk, <laughs> they will always say, what well, you mean in days? Or in days? <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially a historian. Because we, um, you know, and I just want to speak actually particular to Dr. Salam, Dr. Salam that is coming to, <clears throat> Dr. Yusuf Salam was going, going to come and talk here uh, virtually. A as a young uh, a Muslim growing up in New York City, um, the son of an immigrant from Pakistan and a white mother, I, you know, I, I definitely was insulated from police NYPD attention by uh, uh, my skin color. However, Whenever I would have an interaction with the police uh, and they found out my name, things would start to get different. And you get that sort of line of questioning, which is meant to confuse uh, uh, and to make you uh, uh, disoriented uh, over. And you know, these were all very minor incidents that I was involved with. However, um, you know, I, I think we underestimate the, uh, well, the film doesn't mention the role of Islam at all in this, uh, uh, particularly for uh, Yusuf Salam. And uh, I just wanna reflect on how Islam has been racialized in the United States, particularly because uh, before the 1960s, most uh, predominantly all Muslims in the United States were African-American. Um, and so it has been uh, racialized as being a religion uh, of uh, black and brown people. And in New York City with its particular history, it's sort of a double whammy uh, um, based on the history that's happened in New York. I just wanted to add that in for our consideration and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, uh, Dr. Salam when he comes to talk. Agree, agree. I yeah, wanted to- that, Or sorry, go ahead. I wanted to say some about the, tra the trauma that has been inflicted on these young men. Um, Joy, um, uh, the Gru Leary argues that the behaviors experienced by African American are largely related to transgenerational adaption associated with previous traumas during slavery. So she calls the post traumatic slave, she calls it a post traumatic slave syndrome. Like any other trauma, um, slavery disrupted a sense of well being for generations. And this carried through Jim Crow. And what we see with these young men who have been traumatized by the criminal justice system, the media, and then society at large, because no one wanted to hire them. They disowned them. They were ridiculing them in public. Some of their families had to deal with the same circumstances. And so all of them have been traumatized. And um, trauma um, has been noted to go from generations. We as african American. Um, our, our, our parents who are in their 80s, they have great um, grandmothers and fathers who they knew is, that, that were born in slavery. And so this is not a memory that is forgotten. This is a memory that has been discussed. Um, my mother's maternal side knew her, she knew her great grandmother who was 14 at the end of this, at the end of the Civil War, she she knew someone who was born in slavery and lived through slavery. So we're talking about people, a generation of people, where if trauma can go seven generations, seven generations. So experiencing um, these th this memory in, in 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 people's families and experiencing the horror from Jim Crow, the horror from the issues around the civil rights movement, the, the horrors around being policed and criminalized in a, in a community. And now for these men, the horror and trauma for being criminalized and incarcerated for something that you didn't do. My God. Yeah, and it, and it strikes me that, you know, for, I guess for the audience, if, if you're looking at this, from um, the perspective, like wow, 18 or you know, that 1989 was 
a long time ago. I mean, it is, the film is fixed in place in New York City in 1989. Um, but I think Professor Truesdale Moore is right. I mean, really, I mean, the, the movie could take place in 1889, right? Or, yeah, or probably closer to 2019. And the, the um, consistent theme throughout the film is trauma from the beginning. And uh, maybe if um, any of you would care to comment on what happens not after the interrogations, um, trial and incarceration, but the trauma continues when they're released in 2002. And I think that's some, um, any of you wanna comment on how the trauma continues from that point? I mean, it's certainly not, um, oh, and then they were let out of prison and they just kind of went on with their lives. It's, it's much different than that, right? Mm -hmm. I think more, more of a problem now is for them is the social stigma. Uh, like Jamal was talking about being racialized to the Muslim community. Once the social stigma is on them that they have committed such a crime, uh, many in the eyes of many, especially uh, in, the, in the dominant groups community, they will still be viewed as deviant. You see, the social stigma continues as that goes back to what uh, Sirish was talking about. Uh, the, tra the trauma being uh, continuing for seven generations or more, the social stigma too continues because they are never going to be free of this social stigma. See, and that is the, uh, the lasting legacy on, or impact on, the, on their lives. Mm -hmm. they, they will always be seen through the lens of that, even, if they, even though they are not they are free. Mm -hmm. So. Well, the other thing, um, the other thing that is, it's like the elephant in the room, so to speak, is that this, this case was about a white woman, a white middle class woman. And um, when we reflect on 1915, the birth of a nation, this was the most controversial film criminalizing African-American men and the big, depicting them as rapists and monstrous men to be feared. And Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, showed this film in the White House, pro adding to the propaganda and the myth that was perpetuated in this film. And so now you have a society that has gone for years to perpetuate this kind of stigma on black men, this label on black men. So in this situation, this, this crime happens, they are desperate in their power or their privilege or their stereotypes or however you wanna say it, to find someone and say, we found, we just found someone. They were satisfied with just finding a, some black people, not the right person, but some black people. And that, and that, to me, is very, very troubling. And crime is intra-related. I mean, intra-related. And, and when you look at some of the issues around interrelated, is that is a smaller, a smaller um, statistic, but it's typically intra-related. So intra-related meaning black, black on black crime, white on white crime. And when it typically is a black on black crime, um, that is dealing with a uh, rape, it doesn't hold the same kind of attention. Other comments or follow up on that? Uh, Dr. Hogg, were you going to say something or? Okay. Well, the only thing is the how society is viewing them today and uh, questions about race relations, especially with the police uh, and uh, how that is impacting the general population. We are dealing with that issue here in Minneapolis. Uh, this is not going to be a pretty week uh, next week for us either uh, because of the trial. And uh, there are so many cases that came up in the 20s before even that 2018 through 2020, uh, such cases have really grown in in large numbers. So we are still dealing with those issues uh, today. So 
the lasting legacy of the policing and the social inequality and the social stigmas that are characterized by those uh, people we consider as deviant uh, still continues. Uh, so it looks like we do not have a real good answer for some of these inequalities. Someone put in chat, um, do you think that this case, um, the private prisons had, have a lot to do with this? Um, I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't say or identify as private or public. I think prisons all together. We're, you know, that's a whole nother um, conversation about um, prisons. But I will say in the 13th Amendment, we're talking about um, slavery as, as ending slavery, but then in being able to incarcerate and inca punish or incarcerate as a result of a of, of, of deviant deed of some criminalization of some sort. And, and at that point, that's when you saw the convict lease system rise up and you begin to see more imprisonment of um, African-American um, people. So the prison industrial complex is what I would say is more relative to this issue rather than the debate against public and private. Well, to that end, the 1994 crime bill also did not- uh, Didn't help either. It, and it that was under mass, the Clinton administration. It led to mass incarceration. And uh, there were good points in that bill, but one aspect of it, the three strikes you are out aspect was very uh, punitive. Uh, and it uh, disproportionately affected the racial minority groups because for just a small possession of marijuana, you were put, put away uh, for a long period of time. So that has been a pr a probably a bigger problem than anything else. And uh, Alexandra and many others have spoken and written books on the mass incarceration issue. We actually will probably, there is discussion um, because the, the, the amount of money that we pay into holding people incarcerated. I think it costs about $60,000 for one person to be incarcerated. Um, the transition for what we call the prison industrial complex will be transitioned to um, um, the probation system. So the money, the money that we save in prison, they will put be, we have a massive, eventually a massive amount of people on probation at least being able to work to feed into the economy, but we are still have a mass amount of people under the justice system. But you know, you, you had mentioned Woodrow Wilson as an example back then, I guess, um, you no, know, we, there, we've got lots of deeply rooted societal systemic issues and I don't want to lay it all on um, public officials, but then again, what public officials and politicians say matter, that drives it the matters. conversation, right? It matters. And for, for Woodrow Wilson to show the right. birth of the film, Birth of a Nation in the White House, and then he also was said to really embrace it as the truth. And once you do that, then the rest of the country Said, well, it must be true. They put it, it was shown in the White House in the White House, and Woodrow Wilson said so, you know. Yeah, and that there's kind of almost a direct lineage between that and then Mayor Koch, you know, basically you know, saying, no, they're guilty. And then in 2002, there really was a lot of silence at best, right? I mean, there are lots of there are other prominent New Yorkers that um, also just say, nope, they were guilty with that just denial of um, their, you know, their, that their rights had been violated that, you know, so forth and so on. So, um, you know, since I think we're almost up to my, our, our yeah. 15, so let me ask you this, could I ask all of, or each of you maybe to provide maybe one other takeaway on an issue that we haven't discussed that our audience might want to think about between now and hopefully listening to Dr. Salam um, at the end of the month? 
I would sense. like to, um, at some point, what is dear to me is addressing the biases that happen between the arrest and incarcerate, right before incarceration. What happens when they get into the hands of the police at the precinct? What happens when the prosecutor gets a hold of them? What happens when the jury sees them? What happened with that little space that happens because we know that with prosecutors, they have discre- a lot of discretion to, to decide which cases they want to address. If it is a highly publicized um, case, one that will uh, change the trajectory of the, the, his own or her own career, that may be a determinant of how um, society sees it or how he treats it and so forth. So I think that we need to really address that space effectively and fairly. I think the area I want to, people to really look at is the ex-felons or ex-offenders, their challenges when they leave, their re-entry to society, the socialization, of them in society, how do we integrate them into society? Because some of the debate now is even coming along the lines of voting rights. Uh, Many of them have been denied. Ex-felon status. Uh, So we need to look at that because we're gonna have thousands of people released from prisons and majority being people of color and may not be franchised as a result of that measure. There are some states that are working towards that. I do not know if Minnesota has approved that, but a state like Maine, Vermont have allowed ex-felons to vote. Uh, Florida has semblance of that too, but uh, that's work in progress. It's not uniform now. Uh, that you come out of prison, that's taking I was talking, I still stays on uh, because you will not be allowed to vote. In some cases, you will not have uh, employment, housing, and so on. So all these are issues that are going to be uh, problematic for those coming out of uh, prisons. Thank you. And Dr. Hawk, you want to take one final you shot? Bet. Uh- uh, first, I want to note that when, when I kind of looked away from the screen when Ed Koch was talking, and I, I swore it was Donald Trump. Um, they need Koch. So it's no longer the 59th Street Bridge. So sorry, Paul Simon. It's now the Ed Koch Bridge. Um, what really interested me uh, to bring up now, and as particular pertains to MSU, is the removal, removal of education from the uh, uh, prison system. And I know here at MSU, particularly Dr. Hunter, uh, has been working very hard to get an associate's degree program into the Wasika uh, Women's Federal Prison. And uh, um, that I think is a very stunning thing that, that we have so much money invested in prisons, and yet it, it, it is essentially uh, um, focused around labor rather than education. And uh, uh, that's something that I think we all need to reflect on as we move forward. And thank you everybody for this opportunity. All right, well, thank you. And um, and before we wrap up tonight's event, um, just want to once again, invite you to hear Dr. Youssef Salam himself on March 24th, 8 a.m. as part of our 2021 Health and Biomed Summit. Um, again, it is free and open to the public. We just need you to register um, and you can hit up the link for that. Um, and finally, um, Thank you, Dr. Darbo, Dr. Truesdale Moore, Dr. Hawk for your time and your insight on tonight's discussion. And uh, let me just give a quick shout out to Ms. Elise Anderson, our SBS Director of Communications and Events um, for keeping the lights and the films on. Um, And uh, thank you all for joining us. And um, we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good night.